that the Maryland Historic Trust has placed at the site of her death, which is the farmhouse of Walter and Lillian Burgess at the intersection of Powder Mill Road and Riggs Road. And this event is being sponsored by some great organizations, the Coalition of Labor Union Women, the Labor Heritage Foundation, the Metropolitan Washington Council, AFL-CIO, the National Labor College and the George Meany Center, and the great union, the United Mine Workers of America. The historic marker that we are going to unveil following the ceremony really marks the land. It says, this is the place where Mother Jones lived the last few years of her life, and this is the place where she died on November 30th of 1930. Today we are dedicating a labor landmark, and to my mind, a labor landmark is a window through which we view history, labor history. The story of Mother Jones, her last days in Maryland, her fondness for the peace and tranquility of this area, the story of her 100th birthday party, her affection for the Burgess family. We can only touch on this today. And even to do this, we're going to need your help because for those of you who are going to come with us to the site, it's a mere 0.7 miles from uh, this auditorium, but it's going to require some cooperation in forming a carpool. So if you can and you want to come uh, after this event, we're going to have some marshals that are going to line us up into a little car caravan and you can put your lights on and we can drive over to the grounds of the Hillendale Baptist Church where the historic marker is. Now I'd like to start off this program by introducing to you Sue Sherman. Sue Sherman is the president of the George Meany Center and the National Labor College. She is committed to the cause of labor education and because of her efforts thousands of workers have been able to attend union education classes and seminars. Thanks to the leadership of Sue Sherman, union leaders and rank and file members can now earn their college degrees at the National Labor College. This program today would not be happening without the support of the absolutely fabulous staff of the George Meany Center, which Sue directs. Please welcome Sue Sherman. Thank you so much, Saul, and good morning, sisters and brothers. Welcome to Labor's College on this important day when, at long last, we have the opportunity, uh, opportunity to dedicate a permanent marker to one of Labor's greatest heroes. Or if Elise is here listening, perhaps I should say, Shiro's. <laughs> the legacy of Mother Jones surely combines all that we cherish and all that we aspire to as trade unionists and as Americans. We are honored to host the ceremony here at the George Meany Center. There can be no fitting place than here on the campus that the labor movement built for the specific purpose of preserving our heritage that we may never forget those who came before us and that we may recommit ourselves to the struggle for justice and equality that, of all working people. We are proud to co-sponsor this event with the Coalition of Labor Union Women, represented here today by President Gloria Johnson. <laughs> the Labor Heritage Foundation, represented by Secretary Snow, uh, Saul Schneiderman, along with others. The Metro Washington Council of the AFL-CIO, represented by President Josh Williams. And the, and the United Mine Workers of America, represented by President Cecil Roberts. We are also honored to have with us several members of Terrence Powderly's family. Grand nephew John Powderly. Great, great niece, Sister Pat Corby. And great, great nephew, Robert Corby, a member of the NABIT CWA Local 31. 
Bob informed me that he's on call with ABC for the Supreme Court, and he hopes they'll hold off at least long enough that we can uh, complete the ceremony. I also want to say a special uh, thanks in advance to the Montgomery County Police Department for the help that they are about to give us when the ceremony is concluded. We are proud that our own Elise Bryant will direct the chorus that she helped to found. And that Bob Reynolds, editor of our magazine, Labor's Heritage, will share highlights from the recent issue, which is dedicated to Mother Jones and which is on sale uh, here today, and we hope you will all pick up a copy. While an event such as today that we celebrate can only occur through the efforts of many people, there is surely one person without whom it would never have happened. Saul Schneiderman's 20-year quest to commemorate Mother Jones' legacy should remind all of us about the power of one individual's commitment. Saul, we wouldn't be here today without you, brother. We in the labor movement are often accused, and rightly so, of being obsessed with our past. That is because we recognize the truth of the song lyrics, that freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing. Every generation has to win it again. Today, as we honor the example of Mary Harris, Mother Jones, we rededicate ourselves to the values that were her lasting contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. The DC Labor Chorus is the singing arm of our local labor movement. At rallies and picket lines, you'll find the labor chorus raising their voices for equality and social justice. The director, Elise Bryant, is a teacher here at the center, and when she arrived from the University of Michigan a few years ago, she hit the ground running and announced, we need a labor chorus in this area. And here they are today to sing for us the DC Labor Chorus. Thank you, Saul. And thanks to the president and chairman of Labor Heritage Foundation, Joe Glazer, who's going to be singing later. And we invite you all to join us next week for evening of sacred song here in the chapel in our sacred place on the campus of the George Meany Center. Thank you. Yes, and there's little announcements on your chairs to remind you of that. Josh Williams has been president of the Metropolitan Washington Council, AFL-CIO, since 1982. 
And let me tell you folks, thanks to Josh's strategic thinking and organizing efforts, we have one of the most active labor councils in the United States. His job is to balance the interests of 175 affiliated local unions in the nation's capital. And this is no easy task, but then Josh Williams is always eager for new challenges. He just helped coordinate a successful end to the strike at the Washington Hospital Center. Yes. <laughs> And for this, he has won the praise of the over 1,000 nurses that work there. Please welcome our labor leader, Josh Williams. Thank you very much, uh, Saul. And um, I want to join Sue Sherman in in recognizing the just fantastic work that this brother has, um, has done, uh, not only on this issue here, but uh, uh, saw it as someone who's become uh, a rock within the labor movement here in the metropolitan Washington area, someone who I, I can rely on and who I can tell you uh, others, not only here but across the country, can rely on. He's truly been an ambassador uh, for the uh, American labor movement, and we are proud here in Washington that he's part of our movement here. And I certainly wanted to, um, to thank him personally and ask you to just join me again in giving him another round of applause. <laughs> I know that there are uh, some uh, individuals who will certainly be, um, be, you'll be hearing from, but I could not be up here without certainly recognizing, taking the personal privilege to recognize some people who are, are, are really an integral part of, uh, of uh, my professional existence here. Uh, one, of course, uh, you'll be hearing from, and that's Gloria Johnson, who is like a big sister to me, and a big sister to many of us. And of course, my, um, my cellmate, someone who I came to know very, very well, because we spent time in um, in, uh, in jail together, uh, trying to practice exactly what uh, Mother Jones would probably say uh, if um, the test uh, probably is how many of us have gotten arrested for our belief in trying to organize and improve the quality of life of workers. And I, I want to acknowledge uh, the presence of one of my cellmates in that cause, Cecil Roberts, president of the Mine Workers. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Let me try again. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is indeed a great and great uh, auspicious um, occasion. And I want to, to, first of all, welcome you all to uh, the George Mina Center. Join again with, um, with Sue Sherman, who's been doing, who's done a fantastic job, hasn't she, since she's been president, since she's been head of the um, George Meany um, Center, Sue, great work. I want to bring you greetings from the Metropolitan Washington Council, first of all. Uh, you are here in, uh, in our jurisdiction, and I want to uh, thank you all for being uh, present here today, but uh, more, more so, I want to thank you all for the great work that you have done to help build and make this Central Labor Council what it is today. I know Saul um, uh, commented on my work, but my work would not have been possible without the support of, uh, of many of you in here today who are always there uh, when called upon, who have been trailblazers, the one who were there even before uh, my generation and um, who are here today, and um, uh, you're not getting older, you're just getting better. And I want to thank you all, and I ask you to give yourselves a round of applause for all the work that you have been doing. You'll probably be hearing this quote so many times, but I want to, 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 to be the first one this morning to certainly use it. 
and I would bring to your attention the famous quote of Mother Jones, which is that we should mourn for the dead, but fight like hell for the living. And Mother Jones fought like hell while she was alive. And we are gathered here today to establish a lasting tribute to the memory of this remarkable labor leader. The historical marker that we will be dedicating today is a tangible reminder of her work. But there can be no greater tribute, brothers and sisters, to Mother Jones than the living monument of work carrying on her proud tradition of battling fiercely for those with the most need and the least influence, of standing up bravely against wealth, privilege, and power. Here in the metropolitan Washington area, where Mother Jones spent her last year after a lifetime of struggle. Our local labor movement is trying to keep the indomitable spirit of Mother Jones alive every day. We try to do it in organizing drives, at rallies, and picket lines, and in the work we do to build solidarity and people power. Mother Jones wore out innumerable pairs of boots, carrying the Union message deep into the mountains of the cold country not far from here. No hill or holler was too remote for her, no worker too unimportant. Today, we reach out by phone, fax, and email to thousands of activists and workers every week, communicating, organizing, and mobilizing for a better today and a more just tomorrow. That is the legacy of Mother Jones, and it is a legacy that we here in the metropolitan Washington area are proud to try and live up to. In your materials and on your chair, you'll find a small blue card. It's an action pledge card that says we can count on you to volunteer for street heat. I ask you to please, please fill out those cards and hand them in on your way out. And I ask you to do it not because it will help build the largest street heat operation in the country, not because it will help win justice and fairness and a better life for workers in our community. I ask you to do so because it's what Mother Jones would be doing if she were here today. Right. Yeah. Organizing, mobilizing, and moving the labor movement. So do it because Mother Jones would do it and because Mother Jones is in fact here with us today. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Josh. Today we celebrate the life of one of the great figures in American history, in labor history, the miner's angel, the Joan of Arc of the labor movement, the grand old champion of labor, Mary Harris, Mother Jones. Because of her indomitable courage, 
her sympathy for the poor, her bold defiance of authority, and because of her dramatization of the labor struggle, of our labor struggle, Mother Jones is a legendary folk hero and one of the most beloved women in American history. Aren't we fortunate to be assembled here today remembering her life and dedicating the historic marker at the place of her death, the Burgess Farm? Mother Jones was a union organizer and she traveled across the country building a labor movement during very turbulent and troubled times. And by the way, before I forget, aren't we so pleased to have Mother Jones with us here today? Helene, please, Mother jo only Mother Jones would come. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucy. <laughs> Thank you. Only Mother Jones would come to her own commemoration. <laughs> she lived out of her suitcase. Once she was asked by a congressional committee where her residence was, and she replied, my address is like my shoes. It travels with me. I abide where there is a fight against slavery. Many a night she slept in the union hall, in a cheap motel, or on the floor of a worker's home. She used her handbag as a pillow. Mother Jones was five feet tall and weighed no more than 100 pounds. With her snow white hair, her black dress and hat, trimmed with lavender ribbons, she must have appeared grandmotherly as she carried the Union gospel to places like West Virginia, Colorado, and Alabama, not exactly Union-friendly states in the 1900s. She could be kind and gentle. She could be humorous. I met a man in prison once who told me he'd stolen a pair of shoes, she said. I told him if he'd stolen a railroad, he'd be a United States Senator. <laughs> but when she was defending workers on strike for better wages and working conditions, she would rage. Get it right, she said. I'm not a humanitarian. I'm a hellraiser. Mother Jones was a warrior for the working class. She came from a long line of agitators. Her grandfather was hung in the fight for Irish freedom. She came to Canada in 1838 to be with her father, a railroad worker. She became a teacher and taught in the Toronto public schools. At the same time, she learned the skill of dressmaking. At age 31, she met George Jones, an iron molder and staunch union activist. They moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and Mary gave birth to four children. In 1867, Memphis suffered a terrible yellow fever epidemic, and Mary lost her husband George and all of her children within a two-week period. I sat through nights of grief, she said. No one came to me, no one could because the other homes were as stricken as mine. She moved to Chicago and set up a dressmaking shop, but the great Chicago fire of 1871 destroyed her business and she lost all her possessions. She began to attend community meetings in the fire damaged hall of the Knights of Labor and it was there that she received the union spirit and later she would become good friends with Terence Powderly, the leader of the Knights. Uh, we're so pleased to have members of the Powderly family here with us today. In 1890, she was hired as an organizer for a brand new union on the scene, the United Mine Workers of America. She was 60 years old at the time. She participated in the major strikes of her day. Haymarket, Pullman, Ludlow, Colorado, Anthracite, Pennsylvania, the Great Steel Strike. In 1900, she was in Lanaconing, Maryland, helping the Georges Creek miners who struck for higher wages. She stayed with the Powderleys on Fifth Street in the Petworth section of Washington. But then in the late 1920s, she became ill and she needed rest. And so she was taken in by Walter and Lillian Burgess who owned a modest truck farm in the rolling hills along Powder Mill Road in the town that was then called Hyattsville. Lillian Burgess, or Lily May as she was called, would become mother's benefactor and caregiver. 
This is a sad photograph, but it's the only one that we have that actually shows Mother Jones and Lily Mae Burgess in the same, uh, in the same photo. In, in, 19, in the late 1920s, there wasn't a name for the word caregiver. So oftentimes in the newspapers, you see the word Mother Jones' nurse or Mother Jones' uh, benefactor. Lily Mae Burgess would organize the 100th birthday party at the farm. She cared for Mother until the end, and her memoirs are in the archives at West Virginia University, a copy of which is here at the Meany Archives. Dr. H. Hallett was Mother Jones's personal physician and the first doctor to practice in the neighboring town of Silver Spring. He diagnosed that Mother Jones had no organic illness, no cancer or heart disease. She was just plain worn out. She couldn't go on anymore, he said. Mother Jones died on November 30th at 11.55 p.m. And after a memorial service at St. Gabriel's Church in Washington, D.C., she was buried in the Mount Olive, Illinois Cemetery, in the Union Minor Cemetery there. And her last wish to Lily May, that she wanted to live another hundred years in order to fight to the end so there would be no more machine guns and no more sobbing of little children. Lily May kept mother's room exactly the way it was for a long, long time. Two years later, in 1932, Walter Burgess died, and Lily May, now a widow with no children, turned the farmhouse into the Mother Jones Rest Home, a convalescent home, which she operated until the late 1940s. About six months ago, with a lot of help from a lot of people and some luck, I was able to discover the exact location of the Burgess Farm. It's a long story, and it's one that's still evolving. And you can read all about it in Labor's Heritage, which is published by the Meany Archives. And we're going to be selling some at the site that we'll go to after, after this commemoration. The title of my essay is Mother Jones's Final Sojourn, My Search for the House Where the Miner's Angel Died. Now I want to share with you why I spent 20 years on again, off again, searching for the house in which she died. In the 1970s, I was a library technician at the University of Maryland at McKeldin Library, and I started out in AFSME Local 1072, whose president, Sally Davies, is with us here today. The union was campus-wide, but at the library, there were only two union members, Rufus Thompson and myself. And I think that Mr. Thompson was a union member before the building was built. At my job, I would fetch books from the library, and when I discovered Mother Jones, I would read all about her during, during my break times. I tried to be a good shop steward for the union, but it was really hard. Management seemed so self-assured, and I felt so awkward. They seemed to know all the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, the union leaders in Baltimore had trained me that when I dealt with management, they said that I should feel equal with them. But to be honest with you, I felt very uncomfortable sitting in the boss's office. How could I be an advocate for the workers in the library when deep inside I felt so scared? Well, that's when I would go back to my Mother Jones books and read about her courage and her steadfastness, and I became inspired. If Mother Jones could do it, I could do it. And if I could do it, then we could do it. <laughs> To this day, I have her picture on my mirror, along with that of Paul Robeson, and every day she gives me strength. For you see, Mother Jones taught me how not to be afraid. So you can imagine how humble and proud I feel today participating with you in this program. And now I want to thank the good people of the Hillendale Adelphi Beltsville community who helped locate the Burgess Farm. Surrounding the Meany Center is a beautiful community. It has street names like Cherry Hill Road, Sweetbriar Parkway, Pleasant Acres Drive, Wooded Way, and what's the name of the nearest high school to here? High Point High School. These were the hills, the rolling hills of Maryland. And if you stop your car and look around and listen, you'll see in your mind's eye why Mother Jones fell in love with this place. I thank this community from my heart. 
Thank you, Vinette Fowler, the niece of Walter and Lillian Burgess, and the widow of Bert Fowler, who helped to park cars at Mother's 100th birthday. She couldn't be here today, but Bob Reynolds is going to show some of the photographs from her family album shortly. And by the way, in terms of thank you, we really need to thank Isaac Wilson and Jordan Wright from the Meany Center for putting this program on. Isaac is in the back. <laughs> He's the technology coordinator for the Meany Center. And a, and a big thanks to Gary Fritz and Brian Law from the United Mine Workers Organizing Department for putting on this wonderful photo show. And now I'd like to ask Alberta Withers French if she could please stand. Would you mind just, just, just to be recognized? Alberta Withers French grew up on a farm in the area off of New Hampshire Avenue across from the Hillendale Fire Department. Her family settled here around 1900 and her older brother worked at the Burgess Farm during on the day of Mother Jones's 100th birthday party. Her first cousin was treated by Dr. Hallett, Mother Jones' physician, and Alberta has promised me that when all this is over, she's going to give me a guided history tour of the area. Would any of you like to come along? <laughs> Thank you, maybe we can get a bus. <laughs> And I'd like to ask Rebecca Locke Stanford Smith to please stand. Becky. Becky Smith moved to this area in 1953. She was a teenager at the time, attending Northwestern High School. She called the Powder Mill Road area in the 50s the boonies. <laughs> Becky's father, Edgar Locke Stanford, worked at the Washington Navy Yard and was secretary of the local Molders Union. For 20 years, Rebecca lived at 10227 Riggs Road, which was the former personal residence of Lillian Burgess after she moved out of the Mother Jones rest home. Thanks for all your help, Becky. <laughs> and last but not least, Reverend William Moyer, the pastor of the Hillendale Baptist Church, which sits on the property formerly known as the Burgess Farm. Reverend Moyer, has a keen interest in history and has helped Bob Reynolds and I immensely with this project. It was Reverend Moyer who discovered in his church's archives the deed and other historic documents identifying the site. And it was Reverend Moyer who picked me up off the floor after I fainted. <laughs> thank you, Bill, and thank your congregation for all of us here. And now, the video from the Department of Labor, the Friends of the Department of Labor, that includes the only known film footage of Mother Jones taken at her 100th birthday party. in our society. Once, she was called the most dangerous woman in America, but others called her the miner's angel for her struggles for those who scratched for coal deep in the earth. She was Mother Jones, five feet of roaring rhetoric, silver-haired and bespectacled, clothed in black with hat to match. Around the turn of the century, she became famous for her determined efforts for the most helpless in the workforce. Those who labored in the coal mines, textile mills, and garment factories, who were at the mercy of an uncontrolled industrial system that fed on an unending supply of cheap labor. Her unbridled rage at the injustices inflicted on these people and their families became a clarion call for action to alleviate their suffering. It brought the first glimmerings of hope to them and to their wounded and bleeding children slaving away in the mines and mills. The searing invective tumbling forth from this tiny woman struck terror in the hearts of the exploiters. 
And while she had the look of an angel, she had the tongue of a mule skinner. She was a leader of strikers battling for survival, an organizer of workers needing leadership, a protector of children imprisoned in a heartless factory system. She was a champion of the voiceless, condemning the injustices inflicted on them by an often crass and indifferent society. Irish-born Mary Harris Jones was a magnificent scold. She was the monumental conscience of a country absorbed in accumulating wealth at the expense of a ceaseless flow of immigrant workers who sought a better life in the new world. She was a figure wrapped in tragedy. Her union husband and four children perished in an 1867 epidemic of yellow fever. Later, her modest dressmaking business was wiped out in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. But rather than weep for her loss, she began helping those less fortunate, preaching her belief that their best route to a better life would come by joining together for mutual strength and support. She became obsessed with the need to improve the lot of the most helpless of the nation's burgeoning factory system. The end of the 19th century found her moving from mining camp to mining camp, urging those beset by starvation wages and deplorable conditions to join together for mutual help in the newly formed United Mine Workers Union. She became a welcome figure wherever workers struggled for survival, urging organization, cursing the oppressors, rallying the women and children along with the workers in their own defense. She was a valiant woman doing a man's job in a man's world. She adopted workers as her children, and they, in return, called her mother. Her name was forever linked with the coal miners' massive battles in such as Ludlow and Cripple Creek in Colorado, and Fairmont, New River, and Paint and Cabin Creeks in bloody West Virginia. Her crusades against child labor became legend. She met with the nation's presidents from McKinley to Coolidge on behalf of her people. And as late as her 80s, she was still marching and organizing, enduring unbelievable hardships, assassination threats, and jailings. She was uncompromising in her struggles against the power structure. She even fought union attempts at accommodation with the corporate enemies and broke with such miners' leaders as John Mitchell and John L. Lewis. She was, in short, a revolutionary. Introduced once as a humanitarian, she snapped, Get it right! I'm not a humanitarian! I'm a hell risk! Shortly before she died in 1930, she firmly spelled out her philosophy for the newsreel camera. You know, I am considered a Bolshevik, and a Red, and a W, and a Radical, and I admit being all the I'm looking all they charge me with. I'm anything if we change money civilization to a higher and grander civilization for the ages to come. And I long to see the day when labor will have the destinies of the nation in her own hands and that she will stand the united force and show the world what the workers can do. When she died at nearly 100, Mother Jones chose to be laid to rest among her beloved coal miners in the Union Miners Cemetery in Mount Olive, Illinois, faithful to the end. <laughs> and she will stand a united force and show the world what the workers can do. Ray Gomez, thank you for the lights. Can we have a round of applause for Ray, please? Bob Reynolds is the editor of Labor's Heritage. 
which is an exciting labor history journal that tells the story of the rich heritage of America's workers. He's a third generation trade unionist, a member of Local 35 of the Newspaper Guild, CWA. He's an archivist at the George Meany Memorial Archives, and he has worked so hard researching, writing, and planning for this event today. Bob is going to take us uh, through a little bit of tour of Mother Jones in Maryland. Please welcome Bob Reynolds. Mother Jones is a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, speaking of work, Saul has been putting 20 years of his life into this, and you have no idea how much work this gentleman has put in. I have mainly followed in his path and uh, picked up a few things along the way. Uh, this is your project, Saul. Don't let anyone know that, say anything different about that. I just want to say how delighted I am to the support that I've received with regard to this project and to be a a member of the, the Meany Center, National Labor College, and uh, the resources we have here uh, to make it, the, it is the greatest labor education center anywhere, and uh, it will continue to be so and grow forward. What I'm going to try to do, since the Burgess House no longer exists, is try to do with words and photographs, is paint a picture in your mind um, about the Burgess Farm that existed from the 1920s to the 1950s. It's an incomplete story, so that Sol and I welcome the help of anyone as we continue to dig for the entire account of Mother Jones' final years and her legacy to the community. Uh, this is a story, a labor story, it's a community story, it's a story of American history, and it needs to be told, and we need to get everything we can. So let's start with the first. This is uh, a map from the 1950s with the uh, Meany Center and the Burgess House added to give you a sense of how nearby Mother Jones lived. You have the Meany Center, Powder Mill Road, and it, as it intersects Riggs Road, and the Burgess Farm was this area here. Next. This is the Walter and Louis May Burgess home, which is about 1924, with we assume it's Lily May Burgess standing out front. Next. This is Mother Jones enjoying the peace and tranquility of the Burgess farm uh, on October 11th, 1929. She was hale and hearty, and you can see she's clearly enjoying herself. Next. This is the picture on your program. Yeah, Mother Jones is seated between Walter Burgess and his nephew, Bert, Fowler on the front porch of the Burgess home, probably 1928 to 1929. This and the other photographs of the house were provided to, to Saul and me by Vanetta Fowler, as Saul alluded to, Bert's widow. Next. This is a birthday telegram sent to Mother Jones from a longtime friend, John Fitzpatrick. This was one of countless messages she received from, the wor from around the world, as far away as China. Note the Rural Free Delivery Address of Hyattsville, Maryland. Uh, this is about one of 70 manuscript documents uh, that have not been used by scholars, these are unique, uh, about Mother Jones' final years. In the, they are contained in the Meany archives and are available for research. Next. This is, this is Lily Mae Burgess outside her home during Mother Jones' 100th birthday celebration. A section of the house's underground cement foundation is really the only existing portion of the dwelling that still exists. This is the above ground portion of the uh, foundation, but the uh, church has unearthed uh, a portion of uh, the underground uh, foundation. Next. This is Mother Jones preparing to cut her 100th birthday cake. The cake's bottom tier had the union logo right there. <laughs> of the Bakers and Confectioners Workers International Union of America, having been baked by a member of Local 118. <laughs> now, the cake was never eaten, however, because there were plans to, to possibly send it out to the Miners' Convention, and it didn't quite work out, because Mother Jones was invited, and she couldn't make it, uh, but the cake was expected to go, but it didn't come to pass, so what happened to the cake, it, remained in her room, basically a reminder of the wonderful birthday party. 
Next. Now, this is a damaged photo, but it's, it's extremely important because it shows Lily Mae Burgess outside her home during Mother, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong. <laughs> this is the, uh, from 1932 of uh, Lily Mae Burgess with the uh, sign announcing the rest home that uh, perpetuated the uh, legacy of Mother Jones at the site. And if you note the sign, the uh, picture of Mother Jones, which is reproduced very often when, uh, in any uh, reference to Mother Jones, was based on a 1924 drawing created by her close friend, John Bear, who was a cartoonist for Labor, the newspaper of the Railway Brotherhoods. Next. Uh, this is the receipt that uh, one of the documents that Saul referred to uh, from Lily Mae Burgess acknowledging the purchase of her property. And it, this is one of the Hillendale Baptist Church records that confirm the location of the Burgess home. And of course you have the Mother Jones rest home, and, and at the time that Mother Jones resided there, there was no telephone in the house, so this was a, a later, that was a, a later addition. Um, next. Now this picture was taken in 1954 by Rebecca Lofstamper, who was introduced to you earlier, Roxanne Smith, of her daughter, uh, which shows the Burgess house in the background. Next. Now this, the question arose that it did not look like the house that uh, we saw in the earlier pictures. Uh, but the Reverend Moyer pointed out that the roof of the newly visible church was visible. So if you take the assumption that that there is the new church, and you look further on closer inspection, there's a garage type building that's in the back there. And uh, the dwelling porch has been changed, but the assumption there is that uh, it was probably due to the need to have an upstairs porch if you have a lot of elderly residents that have, cannot go up and down stairs very easily. Next. This is the Reverend Moyer and Mrs. Smith and myself uh, on the exact site of the former Burgess House. We're standing approximately 150 feet from the marker we'll be dedicating today. And there you have Riggs Road and Mrs. Smith's former house down in that direction. Next. And this is, in fact, uh, 10227 Riggs Road, which is the house that Mrs. Uh, Burgess eventually moved to from the nearby found farmhouse a few hundred yards away. Uh, Mrs. Smith's family purchased it soon after Mrs. Uh, Burgess sold it to a real estate firm. So as you turn left at the traffic light at Powder Mill Road and Riggs, it will be directly in front of you. Next. And I would like to close by quoting from another manuscript document that the Mini Archives uh, has. It is the conclusion of the May 1st, 1931 nationwide radio memorial program for Mother Jones on what would have been her 101st birthday. The words are as true today as they were 69 years ago. Mother Jones, and I'm quoting, vigor at an advanced age was scarcely believable. On her 100th birthday, she delivered a speech as full of fire as those she delivered in her prime. That's the speech you just saw. Quote, to the very at last, she displayed the same indomitable spirit which has characterized her life of service and self-sacrifice as one of labor's honored leaders. Her courage will be remembered as long as a trade union exists and as long as the spirit of freedom burns within a single heart. There were so many telegrams coming out to the farm for Mother's 100th birthday. They arrived three months before May 1st, 1930, and they were coming months thereafter. And because the house was so isolated here, uh, the telegrams often arrived by motorcycle. And on the night before her birthday party, Mother Jones complained to Lily Mae Burgess that those, those damn motorcycles were keeping her up, but there were just hundreds and hundreds of telegrams arriving. When the Coalition of Labor Union Women, or CLU, held its found founding convention in 1974, do you know what the delegates declared to be the primary goal of their organization? To organize the working women of this country. Now, isn't that something that Mother Jones would have been proud of? Gloria Johnson is a founding member of CLU and has served as its president since 1993. She started her labor career 
in 1954 as a bookkeeper for the International Union of Electronic, Electrical, Salaried, Machine, and Furniture Workers, which many in the labor movement know as IUE. She now directs the women's programs for that union, which recently merged with the Communication Workers of America. And we are so pleased that she has come to be with us today. The president of the Coalition of Labor Union Women, Sister Gloria Johnson. Thank you very, very much. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but isn't this a wonderful occasion? A wonderful occasion. And uh, I am so thrilled that the Coalition of Labor Union Women has played a part in, in making it happen. Unfortunately, our person who has worked with you uh, is not able to be here this morning, but I do want the records to show that we thank Nicole Kresh, who is the director of the Clue Center for Education and Research, for her work with you. Uh, you mentioned the founding of Clue, and out there is Joyce Miller, who was the second president of Clue. <laughs> Joyce, would you stand? Joyce Miller. Jo uh, Joyce Miller was president for many, many years, and when she left, I was elected. But on behalf of CLUE, its officers and members throughout the country, I welcome you to this historical event, Remembering Mother Jones. And I'm so pleased that CLUE is one of the sponsors of this great event. As an organization of union women, it is fitting that CLUE joins in honoring this remarkable person. Many years ago, someone gave me a copy of the autobiography of Mother Jones. The first copyright was in 1925. The second issue was in 1972, and the third edition in 1974. And it is a remarkable book and has provided some of the wonderful history of Mother Jones that uh, I think, Saul, you would be interested in if you, all, if you do not have it already. Clarence Darrow, who wrote the foreword for the third edition, uh, described Mother Jones as one of the most forceful and picturesque figures of the American labor movement. In her early life, she found in the labor movement an outlet for her sympathy and love and daring. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say that Mother Jones was essentially an individualist with her own emotions and ideas so strong that often she was in conflict with others fighting for the same cause. In all her career, Mother Jones never ran away. Her deep convictions and fearless soul always drew her to seek the spot where the fight was hottest and the danger the greatest. She was not in awed by guns or jails. Uh, she kept on her way regardless of friends and foe. She had but one love to which she was always true and that was her cause. And over and over again, she was sentenced by courts. She never ran away. She stayed in prison until her friends opened the door for her to leave and her personal non-resistance was far more powerful than any appeal to force. But there are a couple of stories in this book that illustrate, I think, two things about Mother Jones. Uh, first, a sense of humor, which is just tremendous, and the ability to strategize to get attention, because one thing was pretty clear, so she liked the spotlight. And so, and she knew how to get it. But the one chapter is called How the Women Mopped Up Coaldale. That's the, and this was in Maryland as well. There was a strike and she says she was there. And uh, 150,000 men responded when the strike issue was called. And I'm skipping about on this. The fight went on after they had decided to strike. Then there was this fight. In Coaldale, the miners were not permitted to assemble in any hall, but it was necessary to win that strike. 
And she said, I went to a nearby mining town that was thoroughly organized and asked the women if they would help me get the cold Dale men out. I told them to leave their men at home and to take care of the family. And I asked them to bring their kitchen cloths and mops and brooms and a couple of tin pans. We marched over the mountains 15 miles beating on the tin pans as if they were symbols. And, the, and, and of course, there were those who objected. I'll charge with bayonets, said one of the opposers. On whom, Mother Jones asked. On you people. We are not enemies, she said. We are just a band of working women whose brothers and husbands are in a battle for bread. And these women kept up banging these our pans until daybreak and suddenly the opposition saw these women in kitchen aprons with dish pans and mops and they had to laugh and they laughed and they let us pass an army of strong mining women makes a wonderfully spectacular picture and as the women paraded by with their tin pans and they were beating this out on the tin pans Join the union, join the union, join the union. And she said, and every man there did join the union. And then she said, and I went even further. Anybody I ask who's not organized, let's join the union. And I thought that was such a tremendous story. Just <laughs> one other very, very fast. It's called How the Women sang themselves out of jail. Uh, one day a group of angry women were standing in front of the mine, this was in Pennsylvania, hooting at the scabs that were taking the bread from their children's mouths. The sheriff came and arrested all of the women for, quote, disturbing the peace. Of course he should, as she said, arrested the scabs, for they were the ones who actually were disturbing everybody. <laughs> She said, I told all the women, go get your babies and tiny children and take them with you when your case comes up in court. And they did this, and while the judge was sentencing them to pay $30 or serve 30 days, the babies set up such a terrible wail that you could hardly hear the old judge. I whispered to the women to tell the judge that the miners' wives didn't have nurses to take care of their children so they couldn't leave their children anywhere. They had to keep their children with them. And she said, and I encouraged them. Uh, when they w got to Greensboro, as the car went through town, keep your children with you. And what you do is, when you take your kids into this jail, you sing the whole night long. You can spell one another if you get tired and hoarse, sleep all day and sing all night to the babies. I will bring the little ones milk and fruit. The sheriff's wife was upset. Uh, everybody was, was, was uh, overwhelmed by all this noise coming from all these babies and from these women singing. And, and I can't stop them is what Mother Jones said. They are singing to their little ones. Uh, we can't stop them from doing this. Finally, after five days in which everyone in town had been kept awake, the judge ordered their release. <laughs> and that is the end of that story. Again, on behalf, on behalf of Clue, we thank you, Saul. We thank uh, Sue Sherman for using the George Meany Center and uh, Susan Holleran has played a major role here as well, and we want to extend, extend thanks to her. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Gloria, for those wonderful stories. Gee, I wish we could send Mother Jones to Florida today. <laughs> she would mop up that problem down there. This is from the Associated Press Wire Service from Mount Olive, Illinois, on December 7, 1930. More than 4,000 pay last tribute to the champion of miners. Mine workers throughout Illinois 
and from the coal fields from many other states gathered here today to pay last tribute to Mary Mother Jones, who will be buried in the Miners Union Cemetery here tomorrow morning. The eulogy of Reverend J.W. McGuire was broadcast over the American Federation of Labor radio station, WFCI of Chicago. Wealthy coal operators and capitalists throughout the United States are breathing sighs of relief while toil-worn men and women are weeping tears of bitter grief. The reason for this contrast of relief and sorrow is apparent. Mother Jones is dead. You know, the coal miners stuck with Mary Jones right from the beginning until the very end when she was laid in her final resting place in their cemetery. Is it any wonder that the coal miners called her mother and she called them my boys? Well, brothers and sisters, one of Mother Jones's boys is with us today. Cecil Roberts, the president of the United Mine Workers and a crusader for justice in the coal fields. Born in Cabin Creek, on Cabin Creek in West Virginia, Cecil led the 10-month strike against the Pittston Coal Company, and for his role in that strike, he won the Rainbows Coalition Martin Luther King Award. In 1995, he assumed the presidency of the great union, the United Mine Workers of America. Please welcome President Cecil Roberts. Yes, yes, yes. I want to thank uh, all of you who have taken this time on this day to join us in celebration of the life of perhaps the greatest uh, labor organizer this earth has ever known. But before I continue, I would just like to join with my fellow speakers and thank all of those who have had something to do with this, particularly Saul and his tireless efforts. Last summer, we had a rally in front of the Capitol for health care for our pensioners, and this individual ran up and stuck a flyer in my hands about Mother Jones and this celebration, and that was Saul. Uh, so he's been working tirelessly, and I want to say to the choir that sang this morning, it was so inspirational. Those of you who are from the Meany Center, uh, thank you for everything that you do, not only today, but every day. To my sister, Gloria Johnson, that great labor leader, and to uh, my friend, uh, Josh, who is indeed my cellmate, uh, I look forward to going to jail soon again with Josh <laughs> again. If you've never been to jail, it's not so bad if you're with some friends. The main thing is just go when you know that you're not there forever. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to hearing from the Labor's troubadour, Joe Glazer, who has been an inspiration to all of us. Now, for all those people who had anything to do with this wonderful effort, I would suggest to you that leadership like this doesn't come in bunches like grapes. It's more rare like pearls, and let's give all those people one more round of applause of appreciation. And I want to thank you for that nice round of applause, but I know why I got it. I'm last. Uh, and I will just like to be brief this morning and share a few thoughts if I might. One of the things that I'm very proud about is the union that I come from. In 1890, in Columbus, Ohio, on January 25th, the United Mine Workers of America was formed. Our union consisted of people who could not talk to one another. We had German miners who couldn't speak English, Polish, Italian. We had miners from every nationality throughout the world working in coal mines. And the mines were not organized in 1890. And because of that, coal miners were pretty much slaves. Coal miners lived in company houses, in company towns. 
We're paid with company money called scrip. We're paid by not working per hour, but they were paid by the ton, and the company told them how much coal they loaded because they had what was called then a company check weighman. They had to go to the company store to buy all of their food. And at the end of all of this, working 16-hour days for weeks at a time, the miners would receive no pay. The miners could not come and go as they freely chose. They were pretty much slaves within these coal camps. But the union was formed in 1890 through a lot of courageous people. And one of the first things that the miners did in 1890, they wrote a constitution. And in that constitution, they said you cannot discriminate against any person because of race, creed, color, religion, or any other reason. Because they understood that the principle of united we stand and divided we fall had to come through reaching out for one another regardless of our color or our differences. Ten years later, and I want you to think about this, ten years later, the UMWA hired a woman to be an organizer in about the year 1900. And Johnny Mitchell was the president of the union then and made her the most visible organizer in a coal miners union totally dominated by males. Now, Mother Jones has been called a lot of things, not only today, but she has down through the years and at that time. But there's one thing no one ever doubted whether they were friend or foe, and she wore this very proudly. She said, I'm just a hell raiser. But Mother Jones had a lot to raise hell about because at the time she became an employee of the UMWA and an organizer in 1900. Seven-year-old children of coal miners went to work in the coal mines. Miners developed what they have became uh, affectionately known by the many in the coal camps as miners' pneumonia, which was black lung. Miners died at a young age. They did not have freedom of assembly or freedoms as we know it today. So she went about the business of trying to change all of that. And you heard in the introduction that I'm from a place called Cabin Creek. I was born 15 miles up a holler, and then you turn right. You go on a dirt road back into the hills a little bit further. I was born in a company house delivered by a company doctor in 1946. So it hasn't been that long ago since we got rid of company towns. I lived in a company town until I was 12 years old. I bought my first boots in a company store in 1971 when I started to work in the mines. So we haven't been shed of the company store and the company houses very long back in West Virginia, about 30 years. But in 1912, the miners went on strike on Paint Creek. They had a union on Paint Creek, and they were striking for a better contract. They wanted their own check weighman so a union person could be the one who said, this is how much you earn today. That's a novel thought, isn't it? And they also wanted a little increase on a per ton basis. By the way, the companies had their own tonnage back then. A ton didn't weigh 2,000 pounds in the coal camps. It weighed 2,500 pounds. The miners went on strike over those conditions. Cabin Creek, where I'm from, the miners were non-union. They saw what was going on just over the hill on Paint Creek, and they said, this is a good time for union recognition. So they struck a song for union recognition. Now the first thing that happened is the coal operators went up Paint Creek and up Cabin Creek, and they evicted every striking miner from their homes. The mothers, the fathers, the children, the grandparents, and they loaded them on a train and took them off company property and pitched them. So the striking miners woke up one day and they were sitting by the railroad track and they had to live in tents. And then the companies hired the Baldwin Feltz thugs to build machine gun bar barriers and put machine guns on the property to keep the miners off of their property. Then the next thing that happened is scabs were hired. So 
We had the UMWA on strike on Paint Creek and on Cabin Creek, and they were losing the strike. But who came? This lady named Mother Jones they'd never laid eyes on, and by the way, they made her walk in the creek because the coal companies owned the road. They called that walking the creek back then. And she looked around, and she didn't quite like what she saw. So she called for a rally. And they had this rally in Charleston, West Virginia, on the Capitol grounds. And the governor of West Virginia, now pay attention to this name, was uh, Governor Glasscock. Gl governor Glasscock was for the coal companies. Governor Glasscock was against the miners. So she started out her speech that day, and forgive me for this, but this is what she said. <laughs> Making reference to Governor Glasscock, she said, Crystal Peter, <laughs> pretty novel, and she tore into him and ripped him from one end to the other. Then she gave a little direction to the coal miners. She said, go up Cabin Creek and go up Paint Creek and arm yourselves. Kill every one of these son of a bitches you can find and burn every one of their temples and you'll win this strike. So the miners looking for a little leadership thought that was inspirational. They went up Paint Creek and they went up Cabin Creek and they got their guns and a war broke out affectionately known by many in the community I'm from as the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek Mine Wars. Martial law was declared, and then Mother Jones was put in prison, basically, in this house in Pratt, West Virginia, during martial law. Now, to show you the power of the politics uh, of that time, and as well as today, we had a change in the governor's mansion and Governor Glasscock got voted out, and Governor Hatfield got voted in, by the way, a, a descendant of Devil Ann's Hatfield, and he went up to Paint Creek and Cabin Creek, and he made them let Mother Jones out of jail. She had pneumonia at the time, and they put her in the hospital, and he imposed his own terms, and the union had a contract on Paint Creek, didn't get union recognition on Cabin Creek, but eventually did, and Cabin Creek and Paint Creek, because of Mother Jones's efforts, eventually became one of the strongest union strongholds of the UMWA throughout the nation. And we should say, say thank you to Mother Jones. <laughs> Just one thing to all the women, if I might. Mother Jones, when someone tried to call her a lady, said, I am not a damn lady. <laughs> Excuse me, she said, I am a woman. She said, the rich aristocrats made ladies, but God Almighty made women. <laughs> now we've talked about what Mother Jones did, but I ask you today, let's challenge ourselves. What would Mother Jones think about all of us today and the predicaments we find ourselves in? Well, I think that Mother Jones would lead a fight, Sister Gloria, if she came back here. And one of the things that she would stand up for, and I think all of us should stand up for, is equal rights for every one of God's children, male or female, red, yellow, black, or white. We're all precious in God's sight. I believe that she would look at the labor law that exists today and believe that she had it better in her day because at least she could get a fair gunfight back in 1912 and 13 and 14. I believe she would stand up for changing the labor laws in this country and organizing the unorganized and eliminating scabbing in this country. I believe she'd be totally unimpressed by both the Democrats and the Republicans slapping themselves on the back <laughs> and praising themselves for ending welfare as we know it. We ought to be about the business. 
We ought to be about the business of ending poverty as we know it. And I believe she would tell all of us that every one of God's children that lives in the United States of America ought to have the same health coverage as the President and the Vice President and Congress and the Supreme Court. <laughs> but finally, she would tell us, you're not going to get these things clapping for Cecil Roberts in the Meany Center. You're going to have to get off your ass and on your feet and out the door and hit the street. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Brother Roberts. Thank you for those inspiring words. I want to say something about Joe Glazier. In your program, you'll see two words uh, next to Joe Glazier's name. And those are the two words which he has, he has really been identified in the labor movement for many years. It says, labor's troubadour. But if you examine the body of Joe's work as a singer and a songwriter and a labor educator over the years, I think you'll find that really the two words are solidarity and tradition. Because to me, that's what Joe Glazier is all about. He's the chairman of the Labor Heritage Foundation and the founder of the Great Labor Arts Exchange. Please welcome Joe Glazier. Brother Jones once said, it is an honor to go to jail when your cause is just. And for me, it's an honor to follow Cecil Roberts. Hard act to follow there. These miners know how to talk, I tell you. <laughs> John L. Lewis, Johnny Mitchell, Cecil Roberts, they know how to rouse the blood. And as Cecil Roberts was talking, I was making notes. When he talked about child labor, I said, boy, there's a great song about that. <laughs> when he was talking about the mill town, the mill village, I said, well, I got a wonderful song about that. <laughs> and when he's talking about the check weighman, where the company weighed how much you made, I said, there's a wonderful song about that. Keep your hand upon the dollar and your eyes upon the scale. So that took about, I had about six songs there. <laughs> When he talked about Mother Jones, I figured we'd better just do that one in solidarity forever. When Mother Jones died November 30th, as of yesterday, it's exactly 70 years. 70 years plus one day. Very soon after that, in the West Virginia coal fields, a song appeared, The Death of Mother Jones. Nobody knows who wrote it, but I know it was one of Mother Jones' children. First recording was made by a fellow you may have heard of called Gene Autry. Second recording was made by a fellow named Joe Glazer. Gene did a little better in some ways. <laughs> and I was fortunate to be invited to the Minor Cemetery in Mount Olive, Illinois, where I picked up this Mother Jones Jubilee hat buried with her boys. If you ever get a chance to get out there, you ought to take a look at that wonderful cemetery. And I sang this song. The world today is mourning. The death of Mother Jones. Grief and sorrow hop over the miners' home. This grand old champion of labor has gone to a better land but the hard working miners they miss her guiding hand oh the hills and over the valleys in every mining town 
Mother Jones was ready to help them. She never let them down. In front with the striking miners, she always could be found. She fought for truth and justice. She took a noble stand. With a spirit strong and fearless, she hated that which was wrong. She never gave up fighting until her breath was gone. May the workers all get together and carry out her plan and bring back better conditions for workers throughout. All right. What's that? Take it off. Got to see my handsome head of hair. What's left of it? Are we going to do Solidarity Forever to close? Yeah. There, huh? right there, Joe. All right. This song is appropriate because it comes right out of West Virginia coal fields, written in 1915. Now when the you inspiration through the workers blood shall run there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one but the union makes us Well, they have taken untold millions. They never toiled to earth without our brain and muscle, not a single winter. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that the union makes us. Ah, let me hear it now. Solidarity forever. In our hands is placed the power, greater than the hurt of gold, greater than the might of armies, magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us solidarity forever. Very, very quiet, quiet. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. Thank you, Joe Glazier. Now, Labor's Troubadour, a new book is coming out this year about Joe's life in the labor movement. Now, let me, it's, let me just ask this question. How many people here will be traveling the 0.5 miles to the, the site where the Hillendale Baptist Church is? Okay, what we're gonna do there, if when you leave here, and please don't dilly-dally, okay? If you'll go to your cars and look for a Julie, the, the, someone with an orange vest, we're gonna pull right behind that car and we're gonna wait there and line up like a funeral procession, 
although we shouldn't call it that. Please put your lights on and line up, even if no matter what parking lot you're at, and then we're going to leave in about five to ten minutes from here. So we're going to be traveling down Powder Mill Road and making a left on Riggs and going to the, going to the parking lot of the Hillendale Baptist Church. I'm sorry? Oh, please put your cards in the box, your blue cards for the Metro Council. There's a box that Isaac has at the end. And please pick up a copy of Labor's Heritage, the magazine, which is here for $5, or you can pick one up at the parking lot. Um, there will be a very short, cer there will be a very short ceremony at the lot. We're going to unveil the historic marker, and um, then we're going to go home. So please go to your cars. Thank you. <laughs>